Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may your spirit rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. The first scripture is from Proverbs. You can find it in your Old Testament on page 597. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. The heart of the righteousness weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians 4, verses 25 through 30. You'll find that on page 194 of your New Testament Pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. Let us listen for the word of God. So then putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it is kind of exciting to have uh, a lot of things going on today. Flip-flop Sunday. I have to tell you, when she asked if uh, we should do this every Sunday, my hand did not go up. It's not that I'm not opposed that I'm opposed to that, but I'm not a flip flop kind of guy. So I'm just going to kick mine off here, if you don't mind, and I'll do it barefoot. I figured Jesus probably preached at least one time in his bare feet, and and I find them hard to walk in. And uh, in fact, I stubbed my toe this morning, so you'll notice it if you if you happen to be looking at my feet anyway. So um, so we're continuing our discussion on. Words, and today we're looking at online words. Now, I'm going to take a quick poll before, uh, before we dive into this, but raise your hand if you have ever sent a text message on your phone. Okay, most everybody. How about if you've ever posted something on Facebook? Okay, a lot of hands. How about uh, LinkedIn? A few hands, yeah. How about uh, Snapchat? Group me? Okay. I noticed the young folks over here, their hands were up the whole time. They know them all, right? This all started back in 2003 when a different kind of community known as Facebook was born. Facebook is an online community that brings people together. Is that me? Okay, there we go. It is a community where people share common interests, can connect with one another uh, online in a way that transcends the distance between them. It was originally designed for college students and high school students as a way to connect with one another. But it grew so popular that it ultimately drew fans from all corners of the world. And in fact, in 2010, just seven years later, they had a following of over 500 million users. And just last year, Facebook announced that they have a user base that exceeds 2.3 billion users around the world. A huge part of its popularity 
comes from the ability for you or for me to place something out there online, viewable by the public, and it can be seen instantly by my family, my friends, and others whom I want to see it. I can put a picture out there of my dinner with the words, ooh, look at me eating this huge piece of pizza, and all of my 1,037 friends on Facebook can see it instantly. For all practical purposes, we have complete freedom to put any message we want out there, literally anything. We can express a feeling, an attitude, an opinion, a picture. And our friends have the ability to acknowledge what we post with a thumbs up, uh, a heart, a, some tears perhaps, or even some words of their own. It is their way of sharing in our life experience. The success of Facebook has spawned a plethora of other online communities mentioned earlier, Twitter, Instagram, MySpace, LinkedIn, Snapchat, just to name a few. So it would appear that things in the online community are going really rather well. Everyone is getting connected. We are connecting with friends of all sorts, friends from our distant past, friends who live clear across the globe. We're making all sorts of new friends from all over. It really is amazing that we can connect with anyone at any time, at any place. Yet, appearances can be deceiving, and not everything is well with the online community. You see, what was originally designed to bring people together, to unite people in community with one another, has also become a tool for community destruction. People use this community to propagate false stories. Some in the community insensitively use words that are offensive to others. People are using callous words to incite anger and disappointment and frustration. People use words to push their own theological or political agenda without regard to the feelings of others. People by their words create division within the community. And it's gotten to the point where people for whom this community was originally designed, primarily young people, they've grown disenchanted and disillusioned by all of that, and they've just chosen to leave the community. You start to look at the numbers for Facebook in particular. The numbers of, by age group get smaller as they get younger. That's not the way it used to be. And I think this division is at least a contributing factor to young people just kind of losing interest in Facebook. As we examine all of that, uh, in the light of today's scripture readings. It's like after 2,000 years, Christians still really haven't learned much and history seems to be repeating itself just a little bit. You see, in the early first century, the Apostle Paul journeyed to Ephesus with the idea of building a community. While he was there, he made two trips there. And while he was there, he built a church that would carry on the ministry that he was doing. And during this time in Ephesus, there was tremendous growth in this faith community. People from all different faith traditions were joining this community. They were expressing their faith in Jesus Christ, and they were committed to living out the ideals that Christ Christ lived out. And then Paul left. He journeyed on. He went on his way. He had other churches to build. And with his absence, 
members of the community began to revert back to their pre-Christian moral standards. And these lesser moral standards began to define their conduct. And others in the community, they didn't like that. And they were very vocal and angry and vicious in expressing their dissatisfaction with the way you live your life. People began fighting amongst themselves. And in this letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul makes a dramatic appeal, summoning the reader to rouse from their moral laziness. He calls them to once again be transformed by the Holy Spirit and to live in the light of holy living. Paul exhorts them to speak truthfully and to speak carefully. Don't speak maliciously. Keep your words to what is useful for building up those around you and use words that give grace to those who will hear them. If you look at the cover of today's bulletin, you'll see an illustration that I think captures the sentiment of today's scriptures. When you're about to say something, whether it's online or elsewhere, think. And it raises an important question. Does my online behavior accurately reflect my desire to love God, love my neighbors, and live with purpose. Because frankly, if what I'm about to say or do online doesn't achieve at least one of those three things, then I need to stop and do as the front cover suggests. Social media is a great thing. It's a great way to share our lives with our friends and our family. It is also a great way for this church to connect with our neighbors. Social media presents an excellent opportunity to inform others about the events which are happening here. The, the movie that will occur later on this evening and the event we're having tied to it, I saw it on Facebook and others have seen it and have liked it. So it's a, it's a great way to tell folks what's going on in this church. It's also a great way to share the gospel. Every morning we see some scripture to inspire us from this church. And social media is an excellent way for us to invite others into this church. And whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, your personal behavior online has a lot to do with whether or not people want to join us in our mission. I mean, let's get real for a minute. Our online friends know us, and they know we profess to be followers of Jesus, and they know that we belong to First Presbyterian Church, and that means that everything they see us do online, in plain view is more than just a personal statement. It is also a reflection of Jesus, whom we profess to follow, and it is also a statement about this church to whom we belong. And if one of us posts something harshly that could be controversial or might offend feelings of someone online, will that succeed in bringing them closer to God? Will that encourage them to participate in the life of Christ's church? So when you do put something online, you might want to ask yourself, am I thinking specifically about how I feel in this moment? It's easy to do. Oh, I think this is funny. Oh, I think this is important. Oh, I think everybody ought to think the way I think. But we need to consider if what we're about to do, how will it be received? And will it add any value to the furtherance of God's kingdom? Now, I have to admit that 
I am learning to practice my own teaching in this regard. A couple of weeks ago, Sandra asked the question, has anyone ever read something on Facebook which went against what you believe and said to themselves, well, that's it. That's all I needed. I agree with them now. I've changed my mind. The reality is, the answer to that is an obvious and, and really a laughable no. Yet, I have to admit that I have had my share of attempts to change the online world's thinking through my use of copious and persuasive words many times. I can't believe the whole world isn't listening to me right now. I'm recalling one instance about two years ago when the department store Nordstrom's had announced that they were discontinuing the line of jewelry that was designed by Ivanka Trump. And a number of my friends took that as a political move, and they were expressing extreme disbelief and extreme anger and discontent that Nordstrom's would be picking on her just because she is Donald Trump's daughter. And, and I chimed in, and I said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, guys. I spent six years in retail working my way through college, and I know how retail works. It's got, you've got to turn inventory over. You turn your inventory over every 60 days, and if something doesn't sell, you mark it down and you never order it again. And to that, they replied, I don't believe it. They just knew it had to be political. And, and every response that came in grew in intensity and became a little more vitriolic and a little bit more angry. And, and I started to feel it. And, and I still remember my last statement to them was, well, look on the bright side. At least you're going to be able to buy all that jewelry at deeply discounted prices. <clears throat> And then I noticed a few days later, some of those folks had unfriended me. I'd won the argument, but I lost the battle. So I have to admit that during less mature moments, I have used words to show people just how knowledgeable I am by showing them how foolish they are. I've used words that I knew would create in the recipient and anger that mirrored what I was feeling. And I have only succeeded in turning people off from me and from the point I am trying to make. Sometimes people get the idea that, that preachers are immune to such traps, but I'm here to tell you that go ahead and put me on that pedestal, and I assure you I will knock myself off of it. The truth is that when a person reads words which in their view are controversial or hurtful or dishonorable, they retreat to their original position and become further entrenched. I'm stubborn. I believe what I believe. But my mind can be changed. For example... Over the past 30 years, my perspective of alternative lifestyles has changed. It's changed a lot in ways that I never thought possible. I was raised in an era when LGBTQ people were expected to remain hidden and silent. LGBTQ people were given labels and not allowed to talk openly about who they are or who they love. But my perspective has evolved and it continues to be shaped not by hurtful words, not by personal attacks or words which anger me, not by people making me feel inferior because of how smart they are, and not by people pushing me to see their perspective. My thinking has been changed by people I love, trust, and care about. It is my most trusted friends and spiritual leaders who have shaped my thinking in that regard. Nearly 20 years ago, I received an email from a young man who had been part of the church youth group that I was leading. After his youth group days had passed, he, like a lot of people, went to college, got a degree, 
got a good job in Kansas City, and, and we stayed in contact a little bit over those years, catching a Royals game once or twice. And one day he sent me a note to tell me that he was moving to San Diego to attend law school. But that wasn't the real reason he wrote me. In truth, his email was his way of telling me that he was coming out as a gay man. And as I read his note, my heart was just crushed when I got to the part about how for so long he had lived in fear of being who he is and about how hurt he felt from the attitudes of small-minded middle America as he termed it. Sitting there reading his note, I racked my conscious brain hoping, praying that I would not recall an insensitive comment or a joke at his expense that had ever come from my lips. Concluding his email, he simply said, So I write you because your friendship has meant a lot to me over the years, and I hope this doesn't change anything for you. I haven't changed, but I might have changed in your eyes. So I finish up this email with hope that our friendship continues, but with understanding that our friendship might not ever be able to be the same. Well, in that moment feeling the closeness to him, feeling the love for him, the trust, the relationship that we had had shared for those years. And hearing these words from him, words of complete openness, honesty, and truthfulness, my perspective on this particular thing was shaped dramatically in that moment like never before. And the best I could come up with was to tell him that he was still my dear friend and that nothing had changed other than that he was now the bravest person I had ever met. And I concluded my note by telling him I loved him and that I was proud of him. Do you see? It is through love and understanding and acceptance and openness and honesty, and truthfulness. When we are able to let down our guard to listen and understand where another person is coming from, the words of that young man had given me grace. And in those moments, it is when our perspective can be changed. We enjoy freedom of expression like nowhere else in the world. And with freedom comes responsibility. And in expressing ourselves, online or anywhere, if what we are about to say won't pass through the filters of love, understanding, and acceptance, then perhaps it is best if we say nothing at all. If we really want to make a difference in a positive way, if our goal is to invite others to join us on our mission to love God, love our neighbor, and live with purpose, then we need to think carefully about the messages we put out there. May all that we say, all that we write online, be an invitation to others and be an offering 